I've been preaching a series called Mood. Okay, I choose my mood. First week we talked about I choose to be joyful. Last week uh, we talked about uh, how I choose just to be happy and how I, I'm choosing not to be sad. And this week I'm talking about how I choose to pray. Okay, so say it with me. I choose to pray. I choose to pray. So let's go right into the Word, into the book of Ezra, and look at Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. It's very, very interesting. We're jumping right into a big story, so hang with me. Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. Ezra says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from Him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request to the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road because we had spoken to the king saying, The hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayer. If you jump on down to verse 31, you see the answer to this time of praying and fasting. The Bible says, Then we departed from the river Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us, and He delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambush along the road. So we came to Jerusalem and stayed there three days. What's happening in this passage is that Ezra is coming out of Babylon. He's been part of the Israelites who were exiled there. They're coming back to reestablish the city of Jerusalem and the society there. Though there was a group that had come back a generation before under the leader named Zerubbabel, and they had rebuilt the temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. Ezra was coming back as a teaching scribe and teaching priest. He was coming back to teach the people the law of God. And, and it's interesting, he got great favor from the Persian king, even though he was coming from Babylon. He got great favor from the Persian king, and he had all these resources. Some say the resources were like $5 million worth of gold and silver. And he's leading a group of 1,500 men, which probably relates to like three or 4,000 men, women, and children. And they get out in the middle of the desert on their way to Jerusalem from Babylon, and Ezra gets really concerned that he's going to be attacked by bandits and thieves and they're going to be robbed on the way and so he, he thinks hey should I should I call back to Babylon <laughs> should I get the the resources of the king and then he says no 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 wait I told the king that I served the living God and I told the king that my God was going to take care of us so I'm just going to go with that and so he said we decided to pray and fast and so they prayed and they fasted and God gave them a successful trip all the way to Jerusalem. An interesting little story there, but it shows the power of prayer and, and especially the power of prayer combined with fasting. Now, I'm going to talk about prayer this morning, and prayer is one of the largest subjects I could ever bite off and try to address in a sermon. But I want to begin with this idea. God invented prayer. Prayer is God's idea. God knows everything. I believe He knows the future. Jesus said every hair of our head is numbered. He knows every sparrow that falls. He knows everything that can be known, but yet for some reason, He still delights in His people praying to Him. So prayer is God's idea. So God has just, out of His sovereign wisdom, determined and decreed that you and I pray as a way of communicating with Him and as a way of getting Him to answer our needs and our requests. So prayer is God's idea. Not only that, we're not supposed to do life outside of relationship with God. We're not supposed to do life outside of knowing Him and walking with Him. Just like if you're married in here this morning, uh, what kind of bad marriage would it be if you never talked to your spouse? You have to communicate. Communication is one of the keys of any relationship. And so prayer is our communication line to God. We listen to His voice. We listen to His Word. But we pray to Him as our way of talking to Him. Okay? Now on top of that, prayer also affects our mood. I choose my mood. And so I choose to pray. When things are going well, I choose to pray. 
When things are not going so well, I still choose to pray. When I'm not facing any battles, I choose to pray. When I'm facing tremendous battles, I choose to pray. And prayer affects our mood, okay? It affects how we view life. There's been studies, a scientist, I was watching one scientist from the University of Pennsylvania the other day who is a neuroscientist, and he studies people who pray, especially those who pray in the Spirit. And he's done these tests on folks who come in and he just has them pray in the Spirit for a certain amount of time. And he notices that their brains actually change. And this was the statement of one neuroscientist. He said, neurons that fire together, wire together. So he says, actually, if you devote yourself to regular, consistent prayer, it wires your brain in a certain way that's good for the brain. It wires the brain to focus on God. So prayer not as just a once in a once in a while thing, but prayer as a regular discipline actually shifts the way your brain is wired. Okay, so prayer is God's idea. And again, the ultimate example of prayer to me in the Bible is Jesus. Just as last week we talked about love and how Jesus was the ultimate example of love, Jesus is the ultimate example of prayer to me. If you notice in the Gospels, Jesus prayed early sometimes. Mark says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where He prayed. Also, Jesus prayed by Himself many times. Matthew 14, He dismissed His disciples. Jesus went up on the mountaintop, and He prayed to the Father. Even sometimes the Bible records that he prayed all night long, like in Luke chapter 14. said on one of those days Jesus went to a mountainside to pray and he spent the night praying to God. And Jesus taught on prayer several different places in the scripture. Luke 18, he taught them a parable on how they should pray always and not to give up. And then Jesus obviously prayed when his life was in danger and when he was facing the greatest battle of his life in the Garden of Gethsemane. He told his disciples, he said, you guys sit here while I go and pray. And I'm telling you, there's something about that Garden of Gethsemane moment where Jesus in the midst of being betrayed and and carrying the sin of the world on his shoulders, he got alone with the Father and he prayed and poured out his heart to God. Jesus is our ultimate example of prayer. Now listen, I have a lot of information this morning we're going to roll through, so let's just get right into it. I'm going to give you five whys. as as to why you should pray and why you should choose prayer, okay? Five whys of why we should pray. First of all, we should pray to learn God's will. We should pray to learn God's will. Yeah, ultimately we read the Scripture and we see what God's will is, but we also understand God's will through praying. Just as in our opening passage, I talked about Ezra. Ezra said we fasted and we prayed so that God might show us the right way. Lord, do I call back to Babylon for help? Or, Lord, do I continue forward? What am I to do here? He prayed and fasted that God would show him. David said in Psalms chapter 25, he said, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. So David prayed that God would show him the way to go. Many of you listening to me this morning, you're struggling with a decision in your life or you're struggling with a major uh, transition in your life. You need to commit that thing to prayer. Yes, you can get other people's opinions. You can get counsel. You can even dial up Rabbi Google and see what he says. But ultimately, take that thing to prayer. And sometimes, yeah, but I've prayed about it, Pastor, and I still don't hear anything. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. Don't be patient. Still commit that thing to prayer, and you'll be amazed at how things start happening, things start lining up, relationships start being connected, doors start opening or shutting, and how God leads you into His perfect will when you commit to pray. One of the things I'm asking God most for during this season of fasting and prayer is supernatural wisdom and direction. 
Because our church, I'm so excited about Fountain of Life and what we're doing and how we're expanding overseas and we're reaching people. I was just in a meeting today with some folks this morning about what we're doing overseas in Asia. And it's really so encouraging to see some of our folks in Asia ministering and us sending out teams to South America, sending out teams to Asia. I've been to Africa numerous times in the past two years. And uh, it's just exciting what God is doing in our midst and I'm praying for more doors. I'm praying for wisdom and understanding. It's exciting to see what Fountain of Life is doing it regionally in uh, northeastern North Carolina. We're praying and believing God for a new location for Fountain of Life Church now, and I believe in 2020 God's going to open that up for us and provide the resources for us to reach out to another town and another area in northeastern North Carolina. Can somebody <laughs> say hallelujah to that? So why should I pray? I should pray, number one, to learn God's will. Number two, I should pray to win spiritual battles. I should pray to win spiritual battles. Whether you realize it or not, you're engaged in a battle zone. You live in a battle zone. We're here, there is a real devil and real uh, demons that are against us. And God is real and His angelic hosts are real. And we're living in a battle zone between these two. And Satan comes and he attacks us. But I'm telling you, God has given us, given us the power of prayer and the privilege and opportunity to pray. And he instructs us to pray when we're engaged in spiritual warfare. Matthew chapter 26, Jesus said, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The Spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray so that you won't fall into temptation. When you feel things are not going right, maybe you're under spiritual attack. Maybe you're experiencing uh, physical symptoms and you're experiencing disease and sickness. It might be a spiritual attack that's coming against you. Set your face to pray and seek God. You know, I read a story of Campus Crusade for Christ that was formed by Bill Bright years ago. It's now just called CRU, C-R-U. But Campus Crusade is on campuses, college campuses all over America. And they said a few years ago, they were, there was a, a prestigious American university in the United States, and one of the powerful administrators in this university was blocking the placement of additional full, full-time Christian workers on campus because he was not a believer. He didn't believe in it. He was blocking it. The Christian students on campus started praying. They said, well, if we can't meet and we can't have a full-time Christian worker here, we're just going to pray. They kept praying and they kept praying. And suddenly, for no apparent reason, this administrator was transferred to a powerless position and his replacement was named. And once the replacement came in, one of the first things he asked was, why aren't there more Christian workers at this university? And he opened the door wide open for full-time Christian workers to go to that university. I'm telling you, that's the power of prayer. And that's the power of winning a spiritual battle when you're engaged in battle. That's the power of prayer. Ephesians chapter 6, Paul said, Be strong in the Lord. And in the power of His might, pull on the, put on the full armor of God so that you might stand against the devil's wickedness and his schemes. And then he dropped down to verse 18 of that chapter. He says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Paul says when we're engaged in spiritual warfare, we're to pray and pray that God will shift the battle and allow us to come out victors. Hallelujah. Pray. I pray because it's how I win my spiritual battles. The third reason I choose to pray is because it's how God accomplishes His will in the earth realm. Now this is hard to grasp, and, and it's a theological concept that's really profound and huge here. But God accomplishes His will in the earth realm through His people who pray in faith, believing that He's going to do what He said. Jesus said in John 14, verse 12, He said, I say to you, He who believes in Me, the works that I do, He will do also, and greater works 
then these will he do, because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I choose to pray because it's how God accomplishes His will in the earth realm. Oswald Chambers said this, he said, Prayer does not just equip us for greater works, prayer is the greater work. Think about that. We often think I'm praying because it's preparing me for something greater. But Oswald Chambers is reminding us maybe prayer is the great thing. Maybe when we enter into prayer, it is exactly where God wants us to be. And when we pray, it may, might be in our car, it might be at work, it might be out in the field farming, it might be home. It, it, wherever we're praying, we're engaging with the God of the universe who can do anything and everything in this world that we need Him to do. Hallelujah. I don't know, we can wrestle with this theological concept, and I'm not saying I fully grasp it, but one man said God does nothing except in answer to prayer. Now, I understand he upholds the universe by the sovereignty of his power theologically, but, but go one beyond that. God does nothing in this world except through prayer. God is waiting on his church to pray. One man said this, shout it from the housetops. Prayer is the way his greater works are done. True, most of us will not be worldwide evangelists though a few will be. Most of us will not be gifted in healing, though some will be. Most of us will not be great preachers and teachers, though some will be. But every one of us can kneel down and pray. Every one of us can touch the lost masses of earth and help snatch them from eternal darkness to eternal light. Every one of us can participate in Christ's healing power, spreading both medically and miraculously across the earth. Every one of us can put up our hands and stop the forces of moral degeneracy that threatens to engulf the depths of the human spirit. Every one of us can do these things through our prayers. He said, today, if I will, I can spend 15 minutes in prayer and actually be behind the Kremlin walls in Russia with the Supreme Soviet, influencing them for God and for good. Today, I can spend 20 minutes touching the entrenched Muslims at, at, at the mullahs in Saudi Arabia or the aesthetic Buddhist monks of Nepal. Today, I can stand against pornography and rape and incest and child abuse in far-flung towns in America through my prayers because when I talk to God in my living room or in my office or in my church, He is the same God who reaches into families, into Nepal, into Arabia, into the Kremlin, into the homes, into the trailer parks, into the fields, into the hollers and hills of America, and the cities and the inner cities. The same God, I can do that through my efforts of prayer. Hallelujah. You may feel like you're not all that gifted or you're the least in the kingdom. No, let me tell you something. The, the prayer warriors, I think, are the gold in the kingdom of God. Those are the people that are shaking nations and opening spirit doors and winning spiritual battles. The greatest thing anyone can compliment me by is by coming up and saying, Pastor, we're praying for you. I'm praying for you. It's the greatest compliment I have. So I pray as a way to see the will of God accomplished on planet earth. I'm just going to tell you, Fountain of Life family, the only way we're going to reach our goals, the only way we're going to reach seven counties in northeastern North Carolina and then send out missionaries and then send out evangelists and reach Africa and reach Asia and the Middle East and Ecuador that we're involved in and, and reach an online community. The only way we're going to do this if hundreds of you gather together and join us in prayer on a daily basis saying, God, let your will be done. Just recently, I had a friend contact me, and he said, Pastor, I want you to see this picture, and he showed it to me. He sent it to me, and I looked at it on my phone. He said, this is you preaching right now in a certain unnamed country on television to a potential audience of 200 million Muslims. And not only that, this is being broadcast in 17 other nations. 
And I was, I was blown away that my friend did this. He just put me on TV over there, man. So can you imagine that? No wonder the attacks have, were strong in 2019 because Satan knows that we're the winners here and that we're taking territory for the kingdom of God and there's some drug addicts going to be saved. There's some moms and dads who are lost are going to be saved. There's some unchurched businessmen who's going to be saved. There's some regular Joes and farmers and doctors and lawyers and people and housewives and school age children and, and youth. There's some people going to be saved through Fountain of Life in 2020 and we're not stopping, but we're going to see it accomplished. Can somebody put your hands together and give Jesus a big hand clap? Why do I choose to pray? A couple more things I want to say to you this morning. And listen to this. This is powerful. I choose to pray because it changes my future. I choose to pray because it changes my future. I can't predict the future, but I know a God who is already living in the future. God is already in my future. And when I engage in prayer, then God sets things up for me in my future that He knows I need to walk into. Or He helps me avoid things that He knows I need to avoid in the future. God gets out there in front of me. He's like the pace car in racing. He's out in front of me setting up things and ordering things for my good in the future. I want to let you listen to this. Derek Prince is now... Um, He's now going to be with the Lord, but he was a great Bible teacher from England. And, and he has a little book called Ch Shaping History Through Fasting and Prayer that I've been reading during this season of fasting and prayer. And it's really been amazing. And he tells this story in that book. He said in the 1950s, he had been a medic in the British Army during World War II. And then he lived in Palestine as a British citizen, as the Israelites and the Jews established their nation in 1947-1948. He came home to England and he began pastoring in the early 50s in England. And he said he heard a report. He heard a report that Joseph Stalin, who was the leader of communist Russia at the time, was planning a purge of the Jews from Russia in the early 50s. And he said, when I heard this, my heart went out to the Jewish people, or Jewish people in Russia. And he said, I told my congregation in England about it. And we agreed to fast and pray and devote a special time to pray about this situation in Russia. He said, after we did that, within two weeks, they got a report that Stalin had suddenly died of a brain hemorrhage. And the plan to purge the Jews was lost. He said, no member of my church ever prayed for the death of Stalin. That's not the way we prayed. We simply submitted the situation in Russia to God and trusted Him for the answer. We don't pray for other people to die, but we pray for God's perfect will. And as they were praying for God's will, one little congregation in England, could it be that they were the difference makers? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe they were the difference makers that saved the Jews from... from annihilation in Russia. In the 1940s, in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II, which was one of the single or considered the single bloodiest battles in American history. During the battle, 12,000 U.S. troops were trapped and pinned down in Belgium. The Germans had them surrounded and the German commander actually sent a request to the U.S. commander that he surrender. And General McAuliffe, the U.S. commander, simply replied, nuts. In other words, I'm not surrendering. Well, on the way to their rescue was General uh, Patton. But Patton was pinned down because of horrible weather and he couldn't make it up there. So Patton called in his chaplain. And he asked the chaplain, he said, would you write a prayer that all the guys could pray and pin a prayer to the Lord that God changes this weather. All I need is a 24-hour period and we can make it to the troops in Belgium. And the chaplain struggled with it a little bit because he knew that people would die. And as a result, if God answered this prayer, people would die. But he finally came to the conclusion, well, it's for a good purpose. And so he pinned a prayer 
They printed this prayer and handed it out to the troops. And here was the prayer. Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech Thee of Thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate rains with which we have to contend. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us soldiers who call upon Thee armed with thy power that we may advance from victory to victory and crush the oppression and wickedness of our enemies and establish your justice among men and nations. Miraculously, the rain ceased, the skies opened, and General Patton went and rescued the U.S. troops there. And of course, we went on all the way to Berlin and won World War II. It was what some called Patton's finest hour. His finest hour. Uh, An example in real time of how God shifts and shapes the future when we determine to pray and ask Him His perfect will and walk in His perfect will. Can somebody lift your hand right now and just say it with me? God, You have my future and I'm trusting Your perfect will to be done in Jesus' name. Come on, God shapes my future when I pray. And so we pray boldly and we take hold of the bold promises of God and we declare them for our future. I declare my family will be saved because I know it's the will of God. He said in Acts chapter 16, He would save us and our households. So we take hold of that promise and we declare it for our future. Some of you need to declare the promise of healing over your life, that it is God's will for you to be healed. Some people have believed the lie that, well, maybe I'm sick because I'm learning something great out of this or it's God's will to punish me with sickness. No, no, no. The leper came to Jesus in Matthew chapter eight and and he said lord if you will you can make me clean jesus looked at the leper and he said i will be made whole it it, that verse has encouraged me through the years it is god's will for your healing so claim that promise and pray it and shift the future because of your prayer and faith in the word of god somebody shout hallelujah and amen one other reason why i pray And I really want y'all to get on board with me here. I pray and I choose to pray to usher in revival. I choose to pray to usher in revival. In the Old Testament, in the book of 2 Chronicles, God appeared and spoke to Solomon when he dedicated the temple that he had built for the Lord. And the Lord basically told Solomon, he said, listen, in so many words, Israel's going to turn away from me. And they'll turn away from the God of their fathers. And they'll go to idol gods because God knew what was going to happen. But He gave him this promise in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. He said, when I shut up the heavens, because this was what was going, there was going to be the consequences of Israel falling away from God. He said, when I shut up heaven and there's no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. These were all curses associated with people forsaking God and going after idol gods. He said, so when I cause those things to happen, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and heal their land. I don't know about you, but I believe America needs revival. I believe America needs serious revival in our land. We are living in probably the, the, the greatest unchurched America that ever has been since its foundations. We're living in a time where there are more people not going to church in America than ever before. And church growth of our churches is not even keeping up with population growth. So listen, we're in a dire straits here. We're in a time where we need a move of God and we need revival in America. There was a a revival historian named J. Edwin Orr and he made this statement. He said, no great spiritual awakening has begun anywhere in the world apart from united prayer. No great spiritual awakening has happened anywhere in history that hasn't come through prayer. He said Christians persistently praying for revival. 
We can, fountain of life, be a key to this. We can believe God and start praying for revival in America and see it happen here on the coast of North Carolina and then see it spread all through America. Hallelujah. Evan Roberts, back in the turn of the 1900s in, in the country of Wales, he, he believed that God would answer his prayers and he agreed with another man that they would see 100,000 souls saved in Wales. And you know what? They saw over 100 150,000 people converted and added to the churches in Wales. It was so powerful. If you read the old accounts of the Welsh revival, you'll see amazing things happening. And, it's, and it really revolved around the prayer life of one man, and that was Evan Roberts. I've heard accounts or read accounts that Evan Roberts would come in a church where he was invited to speak, and he wouldn't even be able to speak. He would just go to the center of the aisle in the church and fall on his face and begin praying. He would go to the coal miners at the mouth of the coal mines in the morning, and as they would go to the end of work, he would hand them a scripture or speak a word to them. Then when they came out from their shift, he would be there asking them what they thought about and did they think about that word. And he just had a passion that God would visit Wales with revival and God did exactly what he asked him to do. I think about the first great awakening in America with Jonathan Edwards who was a dedicated man of prayer. I've read where Edwards spent 13 hours a day with the Lord in study and in prayer and great revival came. John Wesley was part of that movement as well who became the father of the Methodist Church in America. John Wesley would not ordain a man into ministry unless that man would fast every Wednesday and Friday and prove himself in prayer. Hallelujah. Look to the Second Great Awakening and what God did in the 1800s with great men of God who dedicated themselves to prayer, such as Charles Finney. Look at the holiness movement in the late 1800s and how God shook America through men who prayed and men who fasted and men who believed God would send a move of God. Or look at the early Pentecostals in the early part of the 20th century where it began in small prayer meetings. The outbreak of the Spirit began with small prayer meetings in Topeka, Kansas, in Houston, Texas, in Cherokee, North Carolina, in Los Angeles, California. Sometimes it was people from the wrong side of the tracks, from the socially economic uh, dregs of the society. They were the ones seeing the move of God, believing God for great things to happen. Look in the 1960s in the charismatic renewal when the Episcopalians and Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians started receiving charismatic experiences. It really happened through small prayer meetings often in homes. Look at the Duquesne weekend in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania where Catholics went from Duquesne University and started experiencing outbreaks of the Holy Spirit with these students in a weekend setting where they were baptized in the Spirit and praying in the Spirit all in small prayer meetings. I'm telling you, revival begins in prayer. Hallelujah. And I know we're in the middle of something here that we're going to see the results of this for years to come. How God is sending revival through the prayers of people at Fountain of Life. Somebody just shout a great big amen. One man who has convicted me through the years as I've, as I've read his works is Leonard Ravenhill. He was a British evangelist who's no longer a, a living, but he was one of these writers on prayer that his, his writings are so rich. And he said this about the churches of his day, and it convicts me still. He said, no man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who's not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players and prayers. Many players and payers, but few prayers. Many singers, few clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many fears, few tears. Much fashion, but little passion. Many interferers, Few intercessors, many writers, but few fighters. Failing here, we fail everywhere. We need some people passionate for the Spirit of the Lord. Some people passionate to pray. Some people in simple faith that believe God can do miraculous things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, I give you praise. 
And I give you honor and I give you glory today. I give you thanks. I'm going to bring this thing down to a close by looking at the commands of Jesus to pray. Just like we were commanded to love, just like we're commanded to rejoice, we are also commanded to pray in Scripture. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who persecute you. Matthew chapter 6, and he said, and when you pray, don't be like the Pharisees. When he's saying when you pray, I think he's assuming that it would be a regular practice and not a once or twice in your lifetime ordeal. He said in Romans 12, Paul said, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Ephesians chapter 6, he said, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. In Philippians 4, Paul said, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Colossians 4, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5, pray continually. 1 Timothy 2, first of all, that prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings be made for everyone. On and on and on, we see in Scripture, number one, when God's people prayed, things happen. The future changed when God's people pray. The second thing we see is that we're commanded over and over to walk with God in a relationship of prayer. You have authority in the name of Jesus to ask anything that's in God's will for you. And God has promised He will move and He will respond. So what happens when we gather together? And we gather together as a group or as a whole church and pray. Well, Jesus said, if any two of you agree as touching anything... I'll do it. It will be done of my Father. And he said, you don't have anything yet because you haven't asked yet. Ask in my name and I'll do it. Hallelujah. Ask in my name and I'll do it. I choose not to sit here and dwell with this anxiety and depression and doubt. I choose to pray. I choose to not be taken out and let Satan get the upper hand on me I choose to pray. I choose not to see America go down the tubes and just become an immoral, degraded, secular nation. I choose to pray. I choose not to see our church disintegrate and have no impact in society, but I choose to pray and see us accomplish everything that God said He would do. Can somebody put your hands together and give the Lord a great hand clap of praise this morning? Hey guys, thanks so much for watching or listening to our podcast. I'm so honored that you tuned in and I pray the sermon was a great blessing to you. I don't know where you are right now in life, but I know one thing, God loves you and he has a plan for your life. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ in your heart, how about praying this prayer with me, opening up your heart and inviting the Lord to come in. Come on, just a simple prayer. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you one of those whosoevers? If so, open up your heart right now and just pray with me. Just say, Father in heaven, I accept Jesus Christ into my life. Forgive me of all my sin and give me a new start today. In Jesus' name I pray. And you can say amen where you are. Please join us online for more information. We hope you come back and visit us. And we love you dearly. And go follow God and go into the destiny that He has for your life.